Good afternoon, and welcome to our centennial celebration, the celebration of the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. And of course, that's the amendment that granted women the right to vote, women's suffrage across the United States. We originally were planning to hold events across the city over a period of two or three weeks, but instead COVID-19 intervened and now we've decided to do this virtual celebration of the centennial, featuring many prominent women leaders here in Nashua and across New Hampshire. Now the process of the amendment, of any constitutional amendment, is that Congress has to pass the amendment first. And that's what happened back in 1919. After many years of working, suffragettes persuaded Congress to pass the amendment. And then, in order to ratify, three quarters of the states have to approve the amendment. Now at the time, back in 1919, 1920, there were 48 states. So it took 36 states to ratify the amendment. New Hampshire was pretty early. New Hampshire was number 16 in September of 1919, the 16th state. Other New England states were early as well, Massachusetts, Maine, Rhode Island. However, Connecticut and Vermont did not pass the amendment until after it was finally ratified. So their votes were not necessary and they did not approve the amendment until it had already uh, become law. But the 36th state, the last state to approve the amendment, was down in Tennessee, where there was a big, big fight, and in the end, a very close vote, but Tennessee was the final state uh, in August of 1920 to approve the 19th Amendment, giving women across our nation the right to vote. But here in New Hampshire, we've always had, for a long time, the tradition of granting women more political involvement than elsewhere in the country. For example, back in 1868, now this is many year, decades before the 19th Amendment, women in New Hampshire were granted the right to vote in school elections, but school elections only, but still the first state to allow that. In addition, over time, uh, we have seen that women have become very involved in the political life and political leadership here in New Hampshire. For a long time, New Hampshire was, had the highest percentage of women participating in the legislature, elected to the legislature. And of course, we have something very unique, which is that Senator Jean Shaheen, who's going to be following me, former Governor Shaheen, uh, was, the, was elected as New Hampshire's first governor, first woman governor in 1996. Uh, she then, after serving three terms in the, as governor, later was elected to the U.S. Senate in, in, in subsequent years. And she was the first woman in the United States to become governor of a state and then a U.S. Senator. Interest, very interesting that Maggie Hassan followed a few years later as governor of the state of New Hampshire. Then, after serving two terms or four years, Governor Hassan also was elected to the U.S. Senate and then was the second woman in the United States to be elected first as governor and then as senator of a specific state. Here in New Hampshire, there was the effort to pass the 19th Amendment was very uh, uh, ongoing for a number of decades. Uh, the, a very prominent woman who was involved was a woman named Marilla Ricker. Uh, she tried to vote, and I think this is a great story, she tried to vote for five decades and was never allowed to vote. In 1910, she decided to try to run for, the, for governor but she was denied the vote, she was denied the right to run for governor because she wasn't a registered voter. She wasn't allowed to register to vote for governor. Now she was already a lawyer, she'd become a member of the bar in 1890. She tried to run for governor in 1910 and she said at the time that it might take at least a hundred years for a woman in New Hampshire to be elected governor. Now it did not take a hundred years 
but it did take 86 years because, as I mentioned, Jean Shaheen was elected as governor here in New Hampshire for the, the first woman in 1996. Uh, one thing that I also wanted to mention is that we, we have a member of Congress, Annie McLean Custer, who you're going to he be hearing from in a little while. Uh, she has a long, her family has deep, deep roots in New Hampshire and her gr great grandmother, whose name was Susan Cushing Bancroft, was a suffragette back in the 1800s and then into the uh, 1900s up to 1920. Thank, I think that's very interesting because of course uh, we have an actual member of Congress, a, a woman member of Congress whose grandmother was involved right here in our state in the suffrage movement. So now we're ready to uh, I, I go ahead and hear from uh, all of the uh, prominent leaders here in New Hampshire. I hope you enjoy our celebration uh, and the next speaker will be Senator Jean Shaheen, who, as I mentioned, was the governor and, the, and then the senator, and now the senator, the first to accomplish that in the whole United States. Thank you very much. I'm Jean Shaheen, and I'm so pleased to join you for this virtual event. Today we celebrate not only the 19th Amendment, but the countless women who fought for decades so that women would one day realize our rights under the Constitution. As the first woman governor and U.S. Senator, I have a deep sense of gratitude for the suffragettes who fought for women's right to vote and for the many women who have shattered barriers in public service. I stand on the shoulders of these fearless, tireless women who refused to accept the status quo and fought for years to secure a place in society like that of men. I think of suffragettes like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott, who organized the first women's rights convention in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848. And Susan B. Anthony, who took up the fight following the first convention. And Harriet Tubman, Ida Wells, and Sojourner Truth, who worked tirelessly for women's rights all while battling the forces of slavery and racism. These leaders understood that rights are merely privileges if they are not enjoyed by everyone in society. This pursuit for equality continues today, and it's in the spirit of our trailblazers that we carry on the fight for justice for all Americans. Alice Paul once described women's suffrage saying, I always feel the movement is a sort of mosaic. Each of us puts in one little stone, and then you get a great mosaic at the end. That's why I encourage each of you to not only celebrate this milestone, but to get involved and look for ways that you can help make your community and our country more fair and just. Remember, there is still much work to be done, but even the smallest stones are a contribution. Change doesn't come by waiting, it comes from acting. So let's get out there and make some history. Thank you all. Burns. I've been telling America's stories for more than 40 years, and one of the most compelling of those stories is winning the right to vote, exercising that right, and shaping our country's history. In New Hampshire, we have a proud tradition of in-person voting, resulting in our being among the highest voter turnout states in the country. Because of COVID-19, though, this year will be different. Wanting to avoid exposure to the virus, many voters will be reluctant to cast their ballot at crowded polling places. For that reason, New Hampshire law has been changed to allow access to absentee ballots and to register to vote by mail. 
to request an absentee ballot or registration materials and be able to vote safely and securely, go to the New Hampshire Secretary of State website, sos.nh.gov, or the website of your town or city clerk. Voters can also apply for an absentee ballot in person without crowds by contacting the town or city clerk. For those who do wish to vote at the polling place on election day, please wear your mask and follow the measures in place for social distancing and safety. However you choose to vote, the important thing is to vote. Our democracy depends on it. Thank you. After the Civil War, suffragists fought to include explicit reference to a woman's right to vote in the new 14th and 15th Amendments to the U.S. Constitution. They failed, but Susan B. Anthony and 14 other women decided to test just what those amendments meant by voting in the election of 1872 in Rochester, New York. The women successfully registered to vote but Susan B. Anthony's eligibility was challenged by a poll watcher on election day. She was arrested and charged with voting without having a lawful right to vote. After she was tried and convicted, Judge Ward Hunt allowed her to make a statement to the court before sentencing. Here are excerpts from that statement. The defendant will rise. Has the prisoner anything to say why sentence shall not be given? Yes, your honor, I have many things to say. For in your ordered verdict of guilty, you have trampled underfoot every vital principle of our government. My natural rights, my civil rights, my political rights, my judicial rights have all been ignored. Robbed of the basic privilege of citizenship, I am lowered from the status of a citizen to that of a subject. And not only myself, but all women are, by your verdict, doomed to political subjection by this so-called form of government. The court cannot listen to you repeat your lawyer's arguments, which already took three hours. May it please your honor. I'm not arguing the question, but simply stating the reasons why the sentence cannot fairly be given against me. When you deny my right to vote, you deny my right to representation as someone who is taxed and my right to a trial by a jury of my peers and therefore my sacred rights to life, liberty, property. The court cannot allow the prisoner to keep talking. But your honor should not deny me this one and only small chance to protest against this high-handed outrage upon my citizens' rights. May it please the court to remember that since the day I was arrested last November, this is the first time that either myself or any woman has been allowed to say anything in their defense before a judge or jury. The court orders the prisoner to sit down. I will not allow another word. When I was brought before your honor for trial, I hoped for a broad and liberal interpretation of the constitution and its recent amendments that should declare equal rights to all persons born or given citizenship in the United States. But I did not get this justice, failing even to get a trial by a jury not of my peers. I do not ask for mercy, but for the full firmness of the law. The court must insist. The prisoner will stand up. The sentence of the court is that you pay a fine of $100 in court costs. May it please your honor, I shall never pay a dollar of your unjust penalty, and I shall strongly and stubbornly continue to urge all women to follow the old revolutionary saying, resistance to tyranny is obedience Order. to God.
new law allows voters to check concerns about COVID-19 to get an absentee ballot. To learn more, visit sos.nh.gov or the website of your town or city to get forms and instructions. Vote safe, New Hampshire. Our democracy depends on it. I'm Cindy Rosenwald, State Senator for District 13, and I'm going to read a poem by Alice Dewar Miller, who was a well-known political and feminist writer from the early 20th century. This is an excerpt from her collection called Our Women People, and it is a pro-women suffrage poem. You're 21 today, Willie, and a danger lurks at the door. I've known about it always, but I never spoke before. When you were only a baby, it seemed so very remote. But you're 21 today, Willie, and old enough to vote. You must not go to the polls, Willie. Never go to the polls, they're dark and dreadful places where many lose their souls. They smirch, degrade, and coarsen. Terrible things they do to you. What would they do to you? Tell me, and I'll tell Father. He'll vote for it, if he can. He casts my vote, and Louisa's, and Sarah, and dear Aunt Chloe. Wouldn't you let him vote for you? Father who loves you so? I've guarded you always, Willie, body and soul from harm. I'll guard your faith and honor, your innocence and charm. From the polls and their evil spirits, politics, rum, and pelf. Do you think I'd send my only son where I would not go myself. Miss Miller's sarcasm maybe hasn't aged that well, but when I think about the fact that my own mother was born before women had the right to vote, I realize how far we've come in really a pretty short amount of time. A hundred years is a moment in the scope of history. And I say, it's great that women can vote. They do vote and their vote really matters. Thanks. Whitney. I'm a journalist, author, biographer, and poet who has been lucky enough to call Nashua and New Hampshire my home for most of my adult life. I'm sitting here today at the Cathedral of the Pines Monument located on Hale Hill Road in Ringe, New Hampshire, the most perfect place in the nation to honor the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. As I'm sitting in front of the first war monument in the nation dedicated to women, and the only monument dedicated to all women, military and civilian, who gave their lives for their country. Today, in tribute to the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, I'm going to read two poems. First, I will read a poem about the pioneering New Hampshire woman, Sarah Josepha Hale of Newport, and I'd like to think that the Cathedral of the Pines is located on Hale Hill Road in deference to her it may or may not be. Second, I will read a poem I've crafted to honor the monument that stands behind me. Thank you. Tribute to Sarah Josepha Hale of Newport, New Hampshire, 1788 to 1879. A Renaissance woman, you lived the 19th Amendment a hundred years before it was passed. 
a career woman long before the Civil War, wife, mother, widow, single mother, teacher, innkeeper, milliner, poet, novelist, journalist, and editor. You possessed an unstoppable passion for writing when few women wrote anything. You were the most influential and powerful editor of your time for more than half a century. A creative genius, you composed the 19th Amendment a hundred years before it was passed. Beginning in the 1920s, you wrote in every literary genre. As artist, you wrote seven volumes of poetry, six volumes of fiction, and several popular books on cooking and housekeeping. As historian, you crafted a 900-page book on women in history. As publisher, you pioneered the creation of American literature by publishing Edgar Allan Poe, Harriet Beecher Stowe, and Lydia Sigourney. Through monthly editorials and thousands of book reviews, you pioneered a national consciousness about gratitude and the rights of women. A resilient survivor, you braved the 19th Amendment a hundred years before it was passed. In 1806, at age 18, you opened a school for boys and girls, an experience that inspired you to write Mary Had a Little Lamb. At age 22, you stopped teaching to help your family run the Rising, the rising Inn Sun Inn. When you lost your family, mother, sisters, and spouse, to illnesses that nearly killed you, you were left a widow with five children under the age of six, a muckraking rebel. You stood up for the 19th Amendment a hundred years before it was passed. At age 33, you became an entrepreneur and began a millinery business with your sister-in-law while writing the novel Northwood, one of the earliest novels dealing with the issue of slavery, crafted a quarter of a century before Harriet Beecher Stowe, in which you gave the most detailed and enhancing picture of a Puritan Thanksgiving in all of American literature, a cause you were as passionate about as women's rights. A visionary, you laid the foundation for the 19th Amendment a hundred years before it was passed. In 1827, Episcopal Reverend John Blake asked you to come to Boston to edit a ladies' magazine created for you. A decade later, you became the first editor of Godey's Ladies' Book of Philadelphia. Whether you were writing from Boston or Philadelphia, in your 55-year career as magazine editor, you shaped thought and empowered men and women to expand their notions about the role of women outside domestic spheres. A fierce advocate, you crafted the 19th Amendment 100 years before it was passed. Still, most of, you, most of us know you as the woman who saved Thanksgiving. Even though President Washington proclaimed the first Thanksgiving day, setting aside the first Thursday in November, as a day of prayer, no regular Thanksgiving day was observed for the next 74 years as states celebrated on various autumn days. For 36 years, you launched and sustained a letter writing campaign to establish a national day of thanks. During the Civil War, President Lincoln proclaimed a national Thanksgiving day, hoping to mend conflicts and differences between the states. Finally, in 1941, Congress ruled the illegal federal Thanksgiving day would be the last Thursday in November. Renaissance woman, creative genius, fearless survivor, muckraking rebel, the visionary, fierce advocate, you embodied the 19th Amendment a hundred years before it was passed. And now I'm gonna read a poem uh, that's dedicated particularly to Cathedral of the Pines, <clears throat> which is the monument behind me. unsung monument, Cathedral of the Pines. A cathedral of giant pines overlooking Mount Monadnock, pruned by Mother Nature in a spring ice storm, clearing the mountain vista to bask in the sun. Here, high on a pine-covered bluff, she stands 55 feet tall and spends most of her time alone, a solitary bell tower the most unsung monument in the nation, like those unsung souls for whom she stands. A study in elegant understatement, her field stones gathered from the very hillside on which she stands. She sings her song to the morning mist, soft summer breezes, fall's crazy quilt, and winter's frozen pines. 
Just down the slope from her is an outdoor altar honoring all war dead, the altar of the nations. In 1945, to honor his son, a World War II pilot shot down over Germany, Dr. Douglas Sloan commissioned the altar of the nations to honor all war dead. In 1967, the altar so moved one visitor, an anonymous woman, that she gifted a half million dollars to Dr. Sloan, fulfilling his dream to build a monument dedicated to women. As a result, Sloan broke ground to build a new monument, a bell tower, that would pay special tribute to women who gave their lives for their country. The first war monument in the nation dedicated solely to women. On her face, she holds four banners of bronze relief, each panel designed by Norman Rockwell and forged by his son, Peter, pays tribute to different populations of women. Facing south is a pioneer woman, rifle in her hand and child at her knee. Facing west, a squadron of women in uniform, war veterans of the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Corps, and Coast Guard. Facing north is Clara Barton and the millions of nurses who died tending the dying. Facing east, she greets the sunrise, honoring all the other women, civilian, less visible, but nevertheless indispensable, a war correspondent, a USO entertainer, a sister of charity nun from the battles of 1812 and the war between the states, a Salvation Army lassie serving the troops in canteen work, and Rosie the Riveter representing all women working in shipyards and munitions plants. Sisters in Sacrifice, who paid for your freedom with their lives. In her womb is Mother Nature, the Tree of Life, a wrought iron sculpture that sits inside the archway of the bell tower and pays tribute to Revelations 22, 1, 2. Tree of Life, which bears 12 manner of fruits and yielding her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations." End quote. Each branch bears a different fruit, the fruits of labor. While the trunk of the tree symbolizes a woman's backbone, representing her stamina, determination, and courage as the mother of men. Henry Ward Beecher said that if he were invited to give an oration on July 4th, he would celebrate the virtue of the four mothers instead of the four fathers. The latter, he said, had monopolized all the glory, although their mothers, wives, and daughters had induced quite as much and evinced at least equal piety and heroism in subduing the wilderness and securing our national independence. Mothers, daughters, granddaughters, bring your loved ones, male and female, to hear the bell toll. When the monument sings, she marks the hour and her cause. It is a battle cry to celebrate all the women who helped forge this nation. Embrace their spirit, be proud to stand on their shoulders, these women died that you could be free. Find power from her chimes, find inspiration in her tower and the stories that she tells. It is a legacy that belongs to all American women of every race, color, and creed, a community of comrades who gave birth to a nation. Let not their sacrifices be in vain, but count their lives, each and every one, as blessings on your own. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Cindy Somnisi Weeks. I recently read a Washington Post article titled, At 88, He is a Historical Rarity, the Living Son of a Slave. This article elaborated in its subtitle that, as the child of someone once considered a piece of property instead of a human being, Daniel Smith is a flesh and blood reminder that slavery wasn't that long ago. Well, for someone like me, not having had the right to vote wasn't that long ago. You see, my father grew up on a farm where his family were labor tenants, what here in the US would have been called sharecroppers or tenant laborers, as were people one step removed from slavery. He, as I, was born in South Africa a country where millions of women, as well as men, were denied the right to vote because of the color of their skin, until just 26 years ago. I have memories of April 1994, when democracy formally replaced apartheid. What stands out most in my mind are the images of people standing in endless lines in the hot sun waiting for the chance to perform the sacred act of casting their ballot and thereby expressing their will for how they wish to be governed and by whom. That was when Nelson Mandela was elected, the first black president in South Africa's history as a country. When I first moved to the United States, I could not vote because I was not a citizen. Yet, I went to great lengths including driving four and a half hours to the consulate in New York to continue voting in South Africa. Happily, I became a US citizen and Granite Stater just in time to get to cast a ballot in the 2016 election. The outcome of that election made crystal clear that while voting matters, and it matters a lot, it is not enough. It is what we might call necessary, but not sufficient. As the venerable John Lewis noted, the vote is precious. It is almost sacred. It is the most powerful nonviolent tool we have in a democracy. I would add, and while the battle for women's right to vote was won in America a century ago, the struggle for equal citizenship for women and people of color and poor people continues. As a child growing up under apartheid South Africa, I knew I wanted to become a lawyer. I wanted to fight for the equal humanity and dignity of all people. Now, as a human rights lawyer and an academic, I seek to be part of that struggle here and abroad and I focus my academic work on the rights of indigenous women in marginalized communities in South Africa who often do not get to exercise the right to vote. Voting is a privilege and it is one that we can never take for granted. Every time my husband and I go to the polls, we take our children with us from as young as when they were newborns because we want to instill in them the appreciation for that sacred right to vote.
Hi, I'm June Lemon. I was formerly a Telegraph columnist, and now I write for my own pleasure and money. These are my thoughts about the 19th Amendment. I was and am a voracious reader. I grew up in the time when people were routinely one-car families, which meant that I rarely got to go to our town library and could only get new books from either the Bookmobile or my school library. Fortunately, both the school library and the Bookmobile carried the Laura Ingalls Wilder Little House on the Prairie series, and I worked my way through them slowly in grammar school. Slowly, because the next one in the series was sometimes checked out, and I waited to read them in order. Laura, of course, was my hero. I wanted to be brave like her. I wanted to be strong like her. I even, for a while, wanted to be a pioneer like her. The Little House books take you from the time when Laura is a child to when she is a young woman ready to be married in these happy golden years. And when Laura and Almanzo decide to get married, they have to discuss their wedding vows. Here's what they said. Well, I'm not going to say I will obey you, said Laura. Are you for women's rights, like Eliza? Almanzo asked in surprise. No, Laura replied. I do not want to vote, but I cannot make a promise that I will not keep. In Almanzo, even if I tried, I do not think I could obey anyone against my better judgment. I was not surprised by Laura saying that she would not obey Almanzo. That decision aligned totally with my idea of who Laura Ingalls Wilder was. But I was shocked by Laura saying she did not want to vote, even though at that time I had no idea of the long and torturous path it took for American women to get the vote. And I am not exaggerating when I say that it was a long and torturous path. The 19th Amendment, which states, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. That amendment was introduced for the first time in 1878. After passage in the House and Senate in the spring of 1919, it was submitted to the states for ratification. On August 18, 1920, Tennessee was the last of the necessary 36 ratifying states to secure adoption of the amendment. The 19th Amendment's adoption was certified on August 26th, 1920, the culmination of a decades-long movement for women's suffrage at both state and national levels. That addresses the length of the fight, which was actually longer when you consider just how long it took to even get that amendment up onto Congress's floor. But I'm not joking about the torture. It was real. After the amendment was rejected again in 1917, Picketing members of the National Women's Party, nicknamed the Silent Sentinels, continued their protests on the sidewalks outside the White House. On July 4th, Independence Day in 1917, police arrested 168 of those protesters who were sent to prison in Lorton, Virginia. Some of these women, including Alice Paul, who was the head of the National Women's Party, went on hunger strikes, some were force-fed, and some were severely beaten. These women suffered for the right to vote. I don't know if Laura Ingalls Wilder ever changed her mind about voting. I hope so. I always vote. I am the granddaughter of immigrants, and I understand just how precious the right to vote is. And this year, even though I work at the polls, I am considering getting an absentee ballot. My vote is important to me, and I want it to be counted. I hope that yours is too. And if you're a woman, you only have that right to vote because of the 19th Amendment. Thanks. You've now heard from some of our prominent women leaders here in Nashua and in New Hampshire, and you'll be hearing from more. But we wanted to take a break to give you a preview of the Mayor's Book Club that we're going to have coming up in September. Now, this is part of our centennial celebration, and the book we're going to be reading is The Woman's Hour, The Fight to Win the Vote by Elaine Weiss. Now, I've read the book already. It's really interesting. 
It is about the fight to ratify the 19th Amendment in Tennessee, the last state that was necessary. And at that time, 35 states had ratified, needing one more, but 13 states had declined. Three states were clearly not going to ratify, were not going to hear the amendment at all, leaving North Carolina and Tennessee. And it was very obvious that North Carolina was not going to pass the amendment. So it came down to Tennessee. And the story that Elaine Weiss, Weiss tells is very interesting, very exciting. Uh, the, the, the battle went on for weeks and weeks. And in the end, uh, the amendment passed in the Senate in Tennessee pretty, pretty easily. But in the House, it came down to only a vote or two and one or two one or two, of course, male members, that's all they had, switched their votes at the end to vote for the amendment, and it passed. But the story is very, very exciting, very interesting. Uh, a lot of uh, personal information, uh, the stories of many of the women that were actively involved in the Tennessee ratification. So I hope you will join us later, later, and it'll be late in September for the, it will be another virtual event, the Mayor's Book Club on the Women's Hour the great fight to win the vote. In any event, I hope you've enjoyed the program so far and uh, there's certainly more to come. Hello everyone. I am Deborah Pignatelli and serve as your executive counselor here in Nashua. I'm happy to participate in this great celebration. Thank you for including me and for all the work it took to organize this event. The second decade of the 20th century was a time of great social and economic experiment in the United States. People demanded and created social, political, and economic changes some of which needed to be addressed through revisions in our Constitution. Congress passed and the states ratified four constitutional amendments between 1913 and 1920, the most constitutional activity our nation had seen since the 1790s. Of these four amendments, we celebrate nationwide only the 19th. Let's have a look, shall we? The 16th Amendment gave Congress the right to collect income taxes. Hmm, crucial, but not much to celebrate there, right? The 17th Amendment allowed the direct election of senators, a cause for celebration maybe, but largely ignored and unknown today. The 18th Amendment prohibited alcohol, but that wasn't really celebrated until its repeal in 1933, right? But the 19th Amendment, guaranteeing women the right to exercise a voice in government through the vote, was widely celebrated in 1920 when it passed and enthusiastically celebrated today as we approach its centennial. My grandmother, Dora Becker, died in the 1980 pandemic, so she was never able to vote but I share her name and have not missed a chance to cast my that ballot since 1970. It was in the early 20th century that Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, and other women suffragists circulated petitions and lobbied Congress to pass a constitutional amendment to enfranchise women. So today, we honor the work and memory of these historic women and the very best way to honor them is to exercise that cherished right that they worked so hard to achieve. Hello, I'm Senator Maggie Hassan. I'm sorry that we couldn't gather together for this 19th Amendment celebration but thank you to the city of Nashua for hosting this virtual event. In 1918, the women's suffrage movement was on the precipice of achieving a decades in the making success when they were confronted with a new and deadly challenge, a global pandemic. The Spanish flu took hundreds of thousands of American lives and threatened to slow the momentum of the suffragist movement. 
It stopped rallies and organizing events just when they were needed most. This year, we mark the centennial of the 19th Amendment in the midst of another global pandemic. As we reflect on this important milestone, we must be clear-eyed about the work left to do. Since the suffragists secured a woman's right to vote in 1920, women have continued to fight for greater inclusion in elected office. In 2018, we saw a record number of women elected to Congress, and I'm proud to be among the 26 sitting female senators serving in Congress. But in the 100 years since the signing of the 19th Amendment, 100 women have yet to serve as United States senators, not even close. Although we are more than half the population, women are far from holding half the seats in the United States Senate. Additionally, right now, there are only nine women serving as governor, and 20 states have still not elected a woman to their corner office. And no woman has served our country as president or vice president. We must do more to strengthen the inclusion of women in our political system. A hundred years ago, when the 19th Amendment was ratified, our country became more equal. But even then, the right to vote was not yet fully secured for black women, black men, and other racial minorities who were too often prevented from exercising this fundamental right. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 helped, but today we still see instances of voter suppression across the country. So at the core of today's celebration is the recognition that there is always more that we must do to make our country more just and more equal. As we mark this centennial, I'm committed to working with all of you to fight for greater equality, including and most critically for protections at the ballot box and to bring more people in from the margins and into the heart and soul of our democracy. Thank you. Hi, I'm John Gregg. And I'm John Lynch. New Hampshire has a proud tradition of in-person voting. In fact, historically, we've been one of the highest turnout states in the nation. Because of COVID-19, this year could be different. That's why New Hampshire law has been changed to add concern about COVID-19 as a reason to request an absentee ballot. Visit the New Hampshire Secretary of State website, sos.nh, gov or the websites of your city or town clerk to get the forms and information you need to vote absentee. This will enable a safe and secure voting and it will reduce crowding at the polling places. For those who want to vote in person, please wear your mask, expect changes for social distancing, and observe the rules. So, whether you're a Republican or Democrat, voting absentee means we can have our traditional high turnout and we can have a safe vote. Our democracy depends on it. The history of the struggle for women's right to vote is a long one, with nas national figures such as Susan B. Anthony, and Lucy Stone and Alice Paul dominating the story. But the fight relied also on the suffragists and their organizations in each state to change the public's perceptions of women's roles. In New Hampshire, we didn't produce any of these national leaders, but we did have a strong women's suffrage movement. Dating from 1868, when Armenia White and her husband, Nathaniel White, went to a national suffrage convention. They came back determined to form a suffrage organization in New Hampshire, and they did. One of their friends was U.S. Senator Henry Blair from New Hampshire, who was the first senator to propose a federal women's suffrage amendment in the U.S. Senate. That was in 1886. It failed, but momentum was building. Marilla Marks Ricker of Dover was an ardent proponent of women's suffrage. In 1870, she demanded a ballot as her right, declaring, I'm over 21, of sound mind, a property owner, and a taxpayer. She was denied, 
but she continued to try to vote every year. In 1910, 10 years before women could vote, she filed to run for governor of New Hampshire to get people in the habit of thinking of women as governors, she said. Her portrait was installed in the State House in 2016, unveiled by New Hampshire's second elected female governor, Maggie Hassan. Other suffrage organizations formed around the state, some with very prominent members. In Cornish, Mr. and Mrs. Maxfield Parish and Mrs. Winston Churchill were active between 1911 and 1920. Another Cornish resident, Juliet Rubley, rode her horse in the 1914 Washington, D.C. suffrage parade as a grand marshal. In Portsmouth, Sally Whittier Hubby headed an organization that used more in-your-face tactics, allied with Alice Paul. Hubby picketed the National Republican Convention in 1920 because they weren't doing enough for ratification of the amendment. And then she lobbied Congress for the ERA in 1924. Visibility for suffrage was important, as shown by this photo of a suffrage truck parade in Nashua around 1918. The man in front is Frank Tafe, and his bride-to-be is Delia Lefevre, one of the suffragists in the cab of the first truck. They were lifelong residents of Nashua. When ratification of the 19th Amendment was nearly accomplished, the National American Woman Suffrage Association realized their work was not done. Women now needed to learn how to use the vote, how government works, and how to study issues so they could vote from a position of knowledge. Thus was formed the League of Women Voters, a nonpartisan organization still dedicated to the same goals of empowering voters. The League has an active presence in the state and a unit in the greater Nashua area. New members are welcome. We want to remind you that in 2020, anyone concerned about COVID-19 may vote absentee. Request an absentee ballot application from your city clerk, fill it out as soon as possible, and return it to the city clerk's office. When you get your ballot, Complete it and return it by mail or in person to the city clerk's office in plenty of time to be counted or vote at the polls as usual if you wish. Your vote matters. Women of America, in all your strength arise. Our cause speeds onward in its might. Awake and acclaim the prize. We're marching on with shout and song. One hope, one aim, one mind. We've crossed the Rubicon at last and burned the bridge behind. We pledge the heart, we join the hand, resolved on victory. We are a bold, determined band, and strike for liberty. Hurrah, hurrah, for equal rights, hurrah. We pledge the heart, we join the hand, Resolved on victory, we are a bold, determined band and strike for liberty. We are a bold, determined band and strike for liberty. Let whittlings laugh and weaklings sneer, they have their little day. A larger vision lures our feet along the better way. Our mothers wept, their tears were vain. We follow clear lights to put
put down man-made wrongs. We raise our sacred women's rights. We only ask an equal chance, the chance to do and be, to grow as do our brothers by responsibility. Hurrah, hurrah, for equal rights, hurrah. We pledge the heart, we join the hand, resolved on victory. We are a bold, determined band, and strike for liberty. We are a bold, determined band, and strike for liberty. Speaking to supporters on November 13, 1913, at the Parsons Theatre in Hartford, Connecticut, British suffragist Emmeline Pankhurst stood in front of a green, white, and purple banner that read, Resistance to Tyranny is Obedience to God. Pankhurst was introduced by Catherine Martha Hewden Hepburn, president of the Connecticut Women's Suffrage Association, co-founder of Planned Parenthood, and mother of a famous actress. Pankhurst was well known as a suffragist who used aggressive tactics at rallies in England. And on that day in Hartford, she spoke for over 90 minutes defending the use of militant protests to further the cause of women's rights. Here, we bring you excerpts from that speech. Since I am a woman, it is necessary to explain why women have adopted revolutionary methods in order to win the rights of citizenship. We women, in trying to make our case clear, always have to make as part of our argument and urge upon men in our audience the fact, a very simple fact, that women are human beings. Suppose the men of Hartford had a grievance and they laid that grievance before their legislature and the legislature obstinately refused to listen to them or to remove their grievance. What would be the proper and the constitutional and the practical way of getting their grievance removed? Well, it is perfectly obvious. At the next general election, the men of Hartford would turn out that legislature and elect a new one. But let the men of Hartford imagine that they were not in the position of being voters at all, that they were governed without their consent being obtained, that the legislature turned an absolutely deaf ear to their demands. What would the men of Hartford do then? They couldn't vote the legislature out. They would have to choose. They would have to make a choice of two evils. They could either submit indefinitely to an unjust state of affairs, or they would have to rise up and adopt some of the antiquated means by which men in the past got their grievances remedied. Your forefathers decided that they must have representation for taxation many, many years ago when they felt that they couldn't wait any longer, when they laid all the arguments before an obstinate British government that they could think of, and when their arguments were absolutely disregarded, when every other means had failed, they began by the Tea Party at Boston, and they went on until they had won the independence of the United States of America. It is about eight years since the word militant was first used to describe what we were doing. It was not militant at all, except that it provoked militancy on the part of those that were opposed to it. When women asked questions in political meetings and failed to get answers, they were not doing anything militant. In Great Britain, it is a custom, a time-honored one, to ask questions of candidates for parliament and ask questions of members of the government. No man was ever put out of a public meeting for asking a question. The first people who were put out of a political meeting for asking questions were women. They were brutally ill-used and they found themselves in jail before 24 hours had expired. You have two babies, very hungry and wanting to be fed. One baby is a patient baby and waits indefinitely until its mother is ready to feed it. The other baby is an impatient baby and cries lustily, screams, and kicks, and makes everybody unpleasant until it is fed. Well, 
we all know perfectly well which baby is attended to first. That is the whole history of politics. You have to make more noise than anybody else. You have to make yourself more obtrusive than anybody else. You have to fill all the papers more than anybody else. <laughs> In fact, you have to be there all the time and see that they do not snow you under. You won your freedom in America when you had the revolution, by bloodshed, by sacrificing human life. You have left it to women in your land, and the men of all civilized countries have left it to women, to work out their own salvation. That is the way in which we women of England are doing. Human life for us is sacred, but we say if any life is to be sacrificed, it shall be ours. We won't do it ourselves, but we will put the enemy in the position where they will have to choose between giving us freedom or giving us death. In New Hampshire, we have a proud tradition of in-person voting, historically resulting in our being among the highest voter turnout states election after election. I am acutely aware of the benefits of coming from a state with high voter turnout as I was elected treasurer in Manchester West High class of 92, a job I conducted with such brazen incompetence that our faculty advisors suggested, or rather insisted, I go into comedy. Because of COVID-19, this year voting is different. Many voters may be reluctant to vote at crowded polling places because of the possibility of infection. New Hampshire law has been changed to add concern about COVID-19 as a reason for requesting an absentee ballot. People also can register to vote by mail. To request an absentee ballot or registration materials, go to the Secretary of State website, sos.nh.gov, or the website of your own town or city clerk where materials and applications can be found and downloaded. This will enable voters to vote safely and securely without encountering lines and crowded polling places. For those of you who do wish to vote at the polling place, please wear your masks, expect changes for social distancing and safety, and please observe the rules. This way we can have our traditional high turnout and be safe. Our democratic system depends on it. Thank you. Hello, my name is Senator Melanie Levake, and I'd like to read a poem called The Revolt of Mother. I am old fashioned, and I think it right that man should know by nature's law eternal, the proper way to rule, to earn, to fight, and exercise those functions called paternal. But even I, a little bit rebel at finding that he knows my job as well, at least he's always ready to expound it, especially in legislative hall. In fact, his thesis is that no one can know what is womanly except a man. I am old fashioned and I am content when he explains the world of art and science and government to him divinely sent. I drink it in with ladylike compliance. I have to thank the suffragettes. Because of them, yes, we are wives and mothers, but also legislators, businesswomen, doctors, lawyers, scientists, and many other careers. We no longer need to drink it with ladylike compliance. We have a seat at the table with qualifications that rival our male counterparts. We are partners in decision-making and leaders in our communities. It is important to commemorate the 19th Amendment, important to remember the struggle for women's rights to vote, 
and be equal partners. I hope that more women will be inspired to be leaders and actively engaged. Regardless of the field that we endeavor, we have the suffragettes to thank for the 19th Amendment and paving the way for our inclusion and success. Hi, I'm Sandy Belknap, and I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to be here today to share some of my thoughts about this celebration that we're having for the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment. Last year, on September 10th, 2019, the centennial anniversary of the state of New Hampshire's ratification of the 19th Amendment, I had the opportunity to hear Elaine Weiss, author of The Woman's Hour, A Great Fight to Win the Vote. This took place at the New Hampshire Institute of Politics, and I found the title of her book to be compelling. The whole idea of there being a fight to win the vote was intriguing to me. According to Ms. Weiss, the entire effort undertaken by the fierce woman who valued equality, including at the ballot boxes, was indeed a perilous and exciting dramatic thriller, especially if you compare that to a great story you might see on the movie screen today. There are big names we're all familiar with from the suffrage movement all with what you call star appeal, including Susan B. Anthony, Alice Paul, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, as well as abolitionist and former enslaved person Frederick Douglass. He actually even spoke at the first women's right convention in Seneca Falls, New York. He was a huge proponent of women's rights. Started on the heels of the abolitionist movement, the suffrage movement was filled with suspense throughout the 70 years it took for women to secure the voting rights that we have today. However, as in all things that are important and historical, sometimes with every step forward, there's always a few steps that we take backwards. While 1920 was the year this right was won, the fight to see the passage of the 19th Amendment started way back in 1850. It took almost three generations of women working together, or dare I say, fighting together, so that today we can celebrate the 19th Amendment being added to the U.S. Constitution a century ago. The amendment is clear and simply states, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on the basis of sex. It's as simple as that. So let's talk about a few of the highlights from New Hampshire that occurred during the 70 year battle to secure the vote for women. One in particular was the effort to include the woman's suffrage into the New Hampshire Constitution back in 1903. 16 years before New Hampshire's ratification in 1919 and 17 years before the final passage of the U.S. Women's Suffrage addition to the U.S. Constitution. Let me read to you a portion of the news from New Hampshire on March 10, 1903, as written by the New York Times. It's titled, Woman's Suffrage in New Hampshire. Today, the proposition to incorporate woman's suffrage in the Constitution of New Hampshire, already passed by the Constitutional Convention of the state, comes up for the vote of the people at the polls. It will be submitted, of course, to an exclusive masculine electorate. But we do not believe that any different result would follow from the submission of it to an exclusively female electorate. In the cases in which the woman's suffrage has been adopted by American communities, the argument that has secured the adoption of it has mainly been that the community in question, being a frontier community, males unduly preponderated, and that the adoption of the measure would tend to attract female immigration. We are not aware that in any instance, any notable influx of women has followed the adoption of this supposed inducement. And we rather imagine that the present governor of New Hampshire expressed the sentiments of the majority of his constituency of either sex when he said in his address to the Granges of the state. We should remember that participation of women in public affairs always tends to draw her interest away from her most sacred duty, that of homemaking. When woman wants the ballot, no honest, intelligent man will withhold it from her. The lack of interest among women in securing the ballot is not so much from failure to recognize its value as from a true appreciation of their present exalted position in the homes of the nation. He went on to say, 
It will doubtless be the wishes and the influence of the woman of New Hampshire that will control the decision that is to be made today, just as much as if the electorate by which is nominally to be decided were composed entirely of women or were already mixed and of both sexes. The New York Times wrapped up this story by stating, so that whatever our notions may be about the desirableness of woman's suffrage, we can await with equanimity what will in any case be the verdict of the women of New Hampshire, always provided that the issue has been brought home to them as it appears that it has. We know that when the substitution for the old fashioned methods, as old as human nature, of the exercise of the influence of women was seriously threatened, honorable women, not a few, took alarm and began to organize in anti-suffrage societies against the proposition that their influence upon public affairs should be reduced to that of humble droppers of ballots in a box. If the women of New Hampshire are really alive to the question that comes up today, we suppose there can be no doubt of the result of the election. So what happened to question number seven on the New Hampshire ballot, also known as the Women's Suffrage Amendment, on March 10, 1903? It was defeated by more than 62% of the population voting against the referral of the New Hampshire Constitutional Convention of 1902. By the way, remember, only men could vote in that election. It would take another 17 years to win the right to vote through the national suffrage movement and the passage of the 19th Amendment. Thankfully, the women of the suffrage movement were persistent, and one of these women were Marilla Ricker from New Hampshire. I'd never learned about Ms. Ricker during New Hampshire history class in the eighth grade here in Nashua, in fact, I didn't learn about her until five years ago in 2016 when her portrait was installed in the New Hampshire State House up in Concord. Let me tell you a little bit about Miss Ricker. She was a woman of first, and she set the stage for other New Hampshire women of first for decades to come, even after she passed away in 1920. Ms. Ricker was New Hampshire's first female lawyer certified to try cases in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. She was reportedly also the first woman in New Hampshire to attempt to register to vote, and in 1871, she was the first woman to have her vote officially acknowledged, even though it did not count. As a New Hampshire property owner, Ms. Ricker believed that if she paid her property taxes, she would have the right to vote. For 50 years, Morella Ricker tried endlessly to vote in every single election, always being denied. Yes, that's persistence. Never moving far from her political goals, Ms. Ricker lobbied President William McKinley for an appointment as Minister of Columbia in the hopes of opening diplomatic opportunities for women. Although she had extensive experience for this position, her request was denied. Still undeterred, Marilla Ricker announced her candidacy for Governor of New Hampshire in 1910. Her filing fee for this position was refused on the grounds that since she could not vote, she couldn't run for office. Ms. Ricker died 100 years ago. In 1920, that was the year that her vote finally counted as a result of the passage of the 19th Amendment. What's impressive to me is that she set the stage for some incredible firsts during my own lifetime. We've since seen the first female governor of New Hampshire become the Granite State's first woman to serve as a U.S. Senator. That's Senator Jean Shaheen, who also happens to be the first American woman to serve as both a Senator and a Governor. We also saw a big first in 2012, with the first in the nation, all-female congressional delegation sent to D.C. from New Hampshire. These women included Nashua's own Senator Kelly Ayotte, Senator Jean Shaheen, and Congresswoman Annie Custer and Carol Shea Porter. All of these women were elected because unlike Marilla Ricker, they could appear on the ballots after women were finally permitted to vote 100 years ago this month. This year, there's great fanfare about the celebration of women winning the right to vote in the United States. Well, 100 years ago might seem like a long time ago. Consider this, there's some Nashuans alive today who lived during a time where it would actually be illegal for a woman to cast a ballot in an election. A hundred years after women winning this precious right, I can think of no better way to honor the women and men who supported the suffrage movement than to cast a ballot in the elections that we have right around the corner in the weeks and months ahead. I think of Marilla Ricker when I vote. If she could try to cast a vote for 50 years and always be denied, the least I can do is show up to cast my ballot 
since she paved the way for me to do so. And I'll be thinking of her again this year on September 8th for the New Hampshire primary and again for the general election on November 3rd. I hope hearing these stories inspires you to do the same. A new law allows voters to check concerns about COVID-19 to get an absentee ballot. To learn more, visit sos.nh.gov or the website of your town or city to get forms and instructions. Vote safe, New Hampshire. Our democracy depends on it. I'm Congresswoman Annie Custer, and I'm honored to participate on this special day to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment with so many distinguished women I have the pleasure to call friends and colleagues. A century after the ratification of the 19th Amendment, we celebrate the tireless work of suffragettes and supporters who were critical to its success. I am reminded of my great-grandmother, Susan Cushing Bancroft of Concord, New Hampshire. A lifelong suffragist and champion of the underserved, my great-grandmother's steadfast devotion to a woman's right to vote was instrumental in our state's passage of the 19th Amendment. As I reflect on the significance of this day, I can't help but think about my mother, former state senator, Susan McLean. A mother of five, she got involved in politics and ran for the legislature in Concord because she wanted to make her community better for her children. She wanted to make New Hampshire a better place for everyone by expanding access to mental health treatment, childcare, high quality education, and by improving the tax structure of our state. My mother served in the New Hampshire House and Senate for 25 years. Our state is better for her service, and I can't help thinking of the contributions that other women could have made over the course of our nation's history if they had been allowed to fully participate in the democratic process. We owe a debt of gratitude to the countless trailblazing women like my great-grandmother and my mother. In 2013, New Hampshire became the first state to send an all-women congressional delegation to Washington, and I was proud to be part of it. Today, I'm proud to be part of the most diverse Congress with the most women ever to serve as members in America's history. Representation is crucial, and it's heartening to see that as time goes on, the United States Congress is finally beginning to look more and more like the America it represents. While these are wonderful symbols of progress, we must acknowledge that there is still much to be done to achieve full gender equality and to ensure that all Americans are able to exercise their right to vote. As we work to recover from the health and economic crisis caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, this is a moment of great anxiety and uncertainty for many. But here in the Granite State and in cities and towns all across the country, people are as engaged as ever and they are making their voices heard in our democracy. While we commemorate this centennial, we're still mourning the loss of an incredible civil rights leader who was willing to risk his life for the right to vote, John Lewis. The women gained the right to vote for the ratification of the 19th Amendment 100 years ago. It was far from the end of the fight to ensure equal access to the ballot box for all Americans, regardless of gender, religion, race, or ethnicity. As we look for ways to honor the legacy of the suffragettes, perhaps there's no better way than to follow their example. As our nation approaches a crossroads this fall, I know that women will be at the front lines fighting for justice and equality. I hope everyone watching this program will be among them. It's an honor to be with you today to celebrate this milestone. Thank you, be well, and stay safe.
Thank you for joining us for our centennial celebration. I wanted to mention one more thing before we go, and that is we will be flying this suffragette flag out in front of City Hall. It's beginning on Monday, August 17th, and we'll be flying it for a week. So if you'd like, like to stop by and see it, please do. Thank you to all of our prominent leaders who participated. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you have a, a good weekend.